Today's segment of Sound Balming is brought to you by Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Body Care. I cannot express to you how much we love, love, love their products. Although we use them all year, as the weather gets colder, we need these products even more. The dreaded drop in temperature, the dryness, the itchiness, and the unnecessary flakiness is inevitable. Shea Butter from Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Body Care is the only thing that works for my skin and hair needs. Not only do these products cure my dry skin, the whipped butter goes on smoothly and doesn't leave that uncomfortably thick, sticky residue. Bonus? It smells absolutely amazing. There are so many different scents to choose from too. Not only do they carry skincare products, there are products for authentic living, face, shower, hair and beard, spritzers and perfumes, and bath products. Let me tell you, we cannot even keep the stuff in the studio. The entire production team as well as all our children use Jimmy and Mary's product. Jimmy and Mary's take pride in creating quality handcrafted products from simple ingredients for the entire family. Their products are made for all skin types and are 100% handmade, 100% vegan, and 100% cruelty-free. Skincare is important. Moisture is key, and keeping our skin and hair hydrated is essential. I cannot emphasize how much we trust Jimmy and Mary's for all of our skincare needs. Hurry on up to jimmyandmarys.com and check out their products. Did I mention service is fast and efficient too? Don't forget to mention that you heard about Jimmy and Mary's authentic skincare on Sound Balming. Use the discount code SOUNDBALM20 to get 15% off. That's SOUNDBALM20 for 15% off at Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Skin Care. Hey everybody, welcome to Sound Balming. I created this show for people who want to experience a radical, life-changing journey through the sounds of my diverse guests. I hope that each sound you hear on this show will strengthen your faith, encourage your dreams, and challenge you to awaken the greatness within you. Drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. This is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new values, and a new experience. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever the time of the day is, you're at the right time at the right place with the right people. Well, who are you talking to? Well, let me introduce myself. Welcome to my show. I'm Dr. Lamar Darnell Shields, the creator of sound bombing. And yes, I'm rocking my sound bombing gear today. And my goal with this show is to introduce you to the people with ideas that will help you unlock your full potential. Like my last guest, Kamini Wood, who she, I'm I'm sorry, like my last guest, Kamini Wood, who talked about transformational coaching. She talked about growing up, being first generation Indian, and then coming to this, you know, living in this country and then discovering her gifts of coaching. So shout out to Comedy Woods. It was amazing. Today is no different from any other day, but I want to start out with some breathing before we introduce our our great guest who's sitting there patiently waiting. And so you all know we start out with our three breaths and we want to go inhale and then exhale. We're going to go inhale, exhale. Then we're going to go inhale deeper, exhale. And what do we call that? We call that the breath of life. Now, how many of you all love to travel? Now, if you listen to my show, I love to travel. Well, our next guest goes from an award-winning sales executive to traveling the world, Matt Javitt, who is living a life of many chapters, all building on the next five-time international sales award winner, 
travel documentarian with his Amazon video show, World Barbershop Adventures, nationally celebrated author with his book, Police, Brotherhood and Uniform Around the World and an ambassador of culture. With his success and a large multinational company, Matt was awarded trips to exotic locations. Who wouldn't want to go to an exotic location? The Globe to celebrate with his peers. This new exposure opened his eyes to adventure and opportunities for cultural immersion. He, along with his wife, had been traveling the world four times since leaving the U.S. In, in February 2017. And during their travels, they share with their audience different ways to keep travel costs down, ideas from volunteering in communities, and tips on networking. But this is what I really love about Matt. He and I have this in common. Not only did he just come back from Latin America, I lived in Latin America, but beyond that, he also stars and produces this show called The World Barbershop. And just like Matt, when I travel, I'm always deciding to sit in somebody's barber chair because I don't care wherever you go. If you are a woman, you go to the salon, you find out what's going on. If you are a male, you go to the barbershop, you find out what's going on. And he's been doing that. So I'm so excited to invite, invite Matt to the show. Welcome to Sound Bombing, Matt. How are you doing? Wonderful. Thanks for having me. So, man, with that with that glowing tan, you got to let people yeah. know where you are just coming from. <laughs> I just got back from uh, Roatan, Honduras. Bienvenidos. Welcome back, man. How is Honduras? How are you doing? And you know that there's a pandemic. I'm sure you heard about the pandemic. So yeah. are you have any issues with COVID? Talk to me about just getting back into the country. Yeah, it was actually, uh, it, wasn't that, it wasn't that bad. Um, it, uh, the Roatan, Honduras, by the way, is a gorgeous, uh, it's a Caribbean island just off the coast of Honduras. You know, about 44 miles long, five miles wide, amazing uh, part of that that region. And it's one of those um, probably less traveled places, but is becoming a shining star in the region. So I, I stumbled upon it and, and wanted to wanted to jump all over it, uh, having the opportunity to go down there. Uh, my, Mickey, uh, my wife, and um, actually my brother and his wife went down there and we just loved it. It's top five scuba in the world, um, awesome snorkeling, second largest coral reef in the world. So we just we just had a blast doing that. But the the, the COVID situation, um, obviously the island was uh, not as active as it usually is. It's a huge cruise line stop um, in that region. So no, with no cruises going on, there's not as much travel. And then uh, obviously not as many people uh, leaving the states and Canada um, and going down there. So uh, had the had a chance to really get a talk to a lot of the locals, which I love to do. Go to a lot of a lot of places. Um, and, and really just understand the culture a lot better. And so that, that aspect was, was pretty awesome. We just had to take the COVID test 72 hours before we went down there. And, um, and then once you just, you bring that documentation down there showing that you're negative. And then uh, on the way home, actually, the States is, is pretty easy to get back. That's where we were, we were kind of shaking our heads where you don't need to test. You don't need to test to come home. You just need to test to go to other places. But I think, I think they're going to change that a little bit. Um, but when it comes to all this, I'm, uh, I, I, I probably turn people off by um, my uh, I, I, I'm socially responsible, but I um, I also understand my freedoms. So um, I take advantage of those freedoms. Well, man, my producer um, said to me that she says, hey, doc, you and Matt have a lot of things in common. I just came back from uh, Aruba uh, on a trip. I just need yeah. to get away, brother. It was my birthday. Yeah, yeah. I just need to get away. I love the islands. I love uh, I just love the Caribbean. I just love the travel. And what's interesting, you know, we, not only do we have that in common, um, you have this, this affinity to barbershops. And we're going to talk about that shortly. But man, just explain, just share with my audience, man, how do you go from leaving this amazing job, making amazing money, being an award-winning sales executive? First of all, it is not easy to sell. Now, you may be great at it, but other people struggle at it. So how, talk to me about the leap of faith. And that's what I want to call it. That leap of faith to walk away and say, I'm going to, I'm going to not, not look back, but I want to move forward. Talk to me what, about what was going on in your mind. And then what steps did you make to prepare for that? Because as we talk about moving, you know, we're talking about moving, leaving one year from 2020 going to 2021. There's some listeners out there who are, who made new year's resolutions. And I hate that word. I said, you know, make some real goals that are attainable. Yeah and also change some of the habits. So walk, walk my listeners through what was going on in your head. That's awesome. You said a lot of, a lot of things there that uh, really speak to me, uh, goals, 
um, and a, a understanding you deserve to live out the life that you dream of. And that's where I was. Um, I, I spent nine years with this amazing international company. And the uh, first two years, like you're saying, sales is hard. First two years were an absolute struggle. Um, hit, hit a stride, um, got some luck involved and uh, hit a hot streak where I won those five international awards. And the cool thing was, was working for a company that's based out of Paris, France. When we celebrated, when they took the top 40 sales professionals around the world to, um, to, to celebrate at the end of the year, we went to crazy places. So Istanbul, Turkey, uh, Goa, India, Chiang Mai, Thailand, Cape Town, South Africa. One year they came to Miami, Florida for our sake. But um, so we'd go on these amazing trips uh, uh, with the other executives. And that was my first exposure to international travel was winning those trips. So I grew up a Navy brat, um, very young parents. So we, we kind of lived on the margins, um, but I excelled in, in sports. So I played uh, uh, Division One basketball. And so that gave me the chance to, when I, when I was a kid, I saw a bunch of the states moving around. But then when I became a, a Division One athlete, I, I got to see a bunch of the country by playing, playing at Duke, playing at Syracuse, playing at Nebraska, seeing all these awesome places around the country. But I never got that international travel. So in my, this was in my uh, mid thirties where I started winning these awards and it blew my mind, the chance to go to Istanbul, Turkey, city of 14 million people, you're stuck there in traffic and uh, you just get to see the intensity and the, and the vibration of everything that's going on around you. And I was, I was from there, I was uh, sold that I needed to see more of the world. So my wife and I, we typically go to Miami or go to Las Vegas or take those types of vacations. And from there we flipped the script and just said, Hey, we're going to start seeing more of the world. So we started going to places like Brazil and Argentina and Panama, the country, Croatia, Greece, Spain. And then we started seeing more. And then as um, we started to get everything in line with our lives, my wife has her doctorate. So we had a lot of student loan there and started getting everything in line. We started to set big dreams and goals and putting those goals on paper and saying, okay, we can do these things. What do we want to do? And one of them was um, uh, travel the world full time. And that's what we did in February, 2017. Uh, one backpack a piece. Uh, we made way um, starting in uh, Santiago, Chile. We spent 27 months on the road to 35 countries. Man, I'm loving that, man. Prior to me having children and a family, I did a lot of that, Matt. And I think that's why uh, my producer was so excited for us to talk. Not saying I'm not doing it now, but now I'm including my children. One thing I do know is travel is deeply educational and connects us as a human race and connects us to other people. What are some things that you're learning about the people that may be similar in every country, every continent, every island, every hamlet, every mountain that you've climbed? What are you seeing the, the deep connections with all humans across the globe? We're, we're an amazing race, man. We, we just, there's, there's uh, so many similarities across the board whether you go to uh, um, the, 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 the struggling parts of the, some of the countries around the world that, that live on the, on the deep margins and, and, and there's really no way out in some cases. Uh, but we all just want, we all want a sense of community. We all want a sense of purpose. Uh, we want laughter and happiness and joy. And uh, it's just those, it's those simple things that we all base our lives on um, that, that we all want. And when you have the chance to share those um, when you get a chance to sit on a dinner table and, and understand people's stories and uh, see the humbleness that comes from people offering that you could stay at their home and they just want to get to know you better. Um, you, you get to see that the world is 99% kind uh, and we only hear about the 1% evil. And it's just, it's, it's that uh, the, the more exposure you get and that education you take, not only about the places that you visit, because that's the amazing part about travel is you learn so much. If you, if you travel the right way and you're not just sitting in a resort and sitting on a, sit on the beach somewhere and, and you're just only taking that if, you, if you're getting out and meeting the people and you're experiencing it in that way and you get to hear those stories and hear how they grew up and and, and the, how they live on a daily basis you learn so much about those people in that country in that in that towns and cities and then you also learn more about our home and, and where we live and you bring that back with you and then you get you get to appreciate uh the luxuries we have in this country just by being born in this in this this lottery ticket of a country you get to appreciate this more and then you, but you also have to appreciate where you're going more as well. Man, you, you said a, a mouthful and I love the concept of appreciation, of appreciation where you're going, appreciation where you came from and appreciation sort of what you want to do next. So we, you talked about what, what's the connection with peoples. What are you, what are some things that you're gaining from this experience 
that you were not getting at your job because a lot of people, Matt, come to this space and come to this platform because they're not satisfied with their jobs. They're not satisfied with their relationships. They're struggling with their spirituality or their faith. They're struggling with diet. They're struggling with these stories that the world has told them over and over again and they brought into that. And what I hear you say is there's this, there's this great book that I read called Soul Craving. Like your soul was craving something that, that you were not getting at your job. What weren't you getting and what are you getting now? Well, it was, it was I wasn't running away from our situation. We, we've, got a, we've got an amazing community. Uh, we live in Indianapolis, Indiana. Got an amazing community here. Great church community. Um, the, the, our friends and family are nearby. Get a chance to spend a lot of time with them. And we, we, we actually, we loved uh, both Nikki and I were better at our peaks and our careers at that time before we left. So everything was extremely positive and, and, and moving in the right direction. But, but we, we did, we had this desire to learn more and educate. I'm all about growth and constant growth and um, getting very uncomfortable to the point that you're, you're learning. And that's what I knew that experience on the road and, and, and it was, we were in a comfortable level. Like we're married 15 years now. We do not have children. I know a lot of people ask that question. Do you have children with the travel? We do not have children, but um, we were, we were very comfortable in life. And I knew that uh, it would, it would help us so much in these next chapters. Cause I'm, I'm all about looking at life at different chapters as we go through and all the things that we learn can take it on to the next chapter. And I knew if we put ourselves in kind of that uncomfortableness of traveling with a single backpack, taking a lot of cold showers, meeting a lot of different people, that it would help us grow in these, in these next years of our lives. And that's what I wanted to do. And I was yearning for um, some of those relationships and just that knowledge on the road in these different cultures that I had exposure to. And it's, you spend 10 days there and 12 days there, uh, like the American uh, vacation system set up, and then you're flying back home and you're, you're thinking like, God, I wish I could have spent more time. And you're looking at the map, thinking about all the other places you want to travel to. So I just wanted to put us in that setting where our days were filled in these areas, walking the markets and meeting the people. And then from that, um, take, take that information and be able to grow on it to understand not only like more about myself, but okay, where do I want to go in my life? Like what, what's calling me? What, am, what are the things I'm trying to do? And uh, that's, that's, that's how we did. And that's, that's the reason I wanted to do it for sure. So when you, uh, you said calling, I believe the great yeah. thing happened when you listen to your souls, your souls calling. What advice do you have for people whose soul is calling out, but they're like, listen, I'm changing the station. Uh, I think I hear a commercial break. I think that my earbuds are not working because I am afraid to step out, even though my soul is, lo is, is longing to do something different. You got to understand you deserve it. If you put in the time and effort to put yourselves in a scenario where um, you've got these bigger ideas and bigger dreams, then you, you got to understand you do deserve that. Because there was a time in, in our goal process where I was continue to doubt myself. As we were getting close to having the money ready to, to make the trip, I was thinking, man, is this, is this sure this is me? And then as you research and you start to see the other people that have done it before you, you're like, man, this guy did it. This girl did it. Why, why can't why can't I deserve this? And as as so, you got to understand, you do deserve to live the life that you want to live. But it's it's the negativity and the outside influence of the people that they want you to stay at the same level as them. So then they don't feel bad about their lives. And you got to get beyond that and understand, like, oh, it's it's okay for me to live out my dreams. I don't if there's people surrounding me that that aren't my true fans and supporters. Maybe I need to start eliminating some of those people. And, and, and build myself around the people that are clapping and cheering me on to live out my dreams. And once you realize that, and it's okay to, to prosper and do good things, then, then you start to see yourself kind of stepping up that ladder. Well, I know that you are a fan and a reader of, of Paulo Coelho, the book of the alchemist, because of like everything that you've actually done and talked about. I know one of the things that he said, I'm a huge fan of this, 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 this intellectual, he says, and when you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you achieve it. What does that actually mean to you? I just got chills, brother. I just got chills. Um, it's, it's in this, in, in our process to get ready. So it was, a, um, once we kind of made the decision, it was 10 months before we, we, we left. And it was always kind of those things like, Hey, we can pull out. Cause I, I booked the first flight and I was like, well, we can pull, pull out. And I booked the second flight and I was like, we can pull out. So, so there was always that thing where you can, where you can leave. But as, as we finally made the decision about five months before that, we're like, we, we better start getting our stuff in order financially, our, our, our home, all the different stuff we might want to get rid of. 
the the world kind of just kept laying out things for us. Like it was it was amazing how how everything kept coming together to make everything so perfect in our life. And I think that's what it is. I think if you make a decision and you're saying I'm going to go do this thing, and you put in the time and effort and energy to make it um, to make it a reality, you'll be surprised how how things begin to narrow and that vision becomes to take its own take its own life and uh, great things start to happen. And again, it's one of those things where you can't be afraid of all the goodness that's going on and all these, these awesome things that are happening because it just means it's, it's, the right, it's the right time and the right signals. Well, man, I have created, I created a, a, a series. It's a traveling show uh, called Fades and Fellowship. And it starred basically Dr. King's barber, like Dr. King's real barber. His name is Nelson Malden, 82 years old. Look better than both of us, man. Yeah. met Dr. King when Dr. King was very, very young. And when I met him, I wanted people to know his story because anytime you sit in a barber's chair, you know this, you yeah. are take, you, we share stuff with our barbers that we don't even share with our significant others. We take to the grave that our barbers know so much information about, about who we are. And just like you, Matt, whenever I travel, I have these routines, man. I have these routines and rituals when I travel. But one of the things that I do is I'm always stopping by a barber shop. Now I don't let them cut my hair because my my hair with my barber, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I stick to, the, you know, allowing other people to, but I let them shape me up. I won't, won't go too yeah, yeah. because yeah. I got to respect. There's a code right in the barber shop. Well, at any rate, just like you, I know that if I step into any barber shop, I'm going to get a lesson. I'm going to learn a story. You think about the famous scene on a coming to America, Eddie Murphy yeah, comes yeah. into America and he goes to the barbershop and he, he portrays all, all of, all of these characters, but you know, in the barbershop, um, there's some valuable lessons that are there. And so just like you, you create this work, just like I did. Uh, mine was a storytelling series on stage in front of a live audience. Yours is, is a series called the world barbershop. And I think you got a chance to meet Anthony Bourdain, which I'm looking, I'm like, blown away thinking about him and his life and and how how his life ended what why did you decide to go to barbershops in the countries that you visited and what are some things that you discovered that may be similar in almost every barber's chair that you've gone to in all the countries uh and including the united states because i want people to understand if you've never been to a barbershop you just don't know what's going on just like going yeah. into a salon but what are some similarities and maybe some of the differences uh, from some of the stories that you heard in those shops. Yeah, so so um, obviously spending 27 straight months on the road, I had I had to get my hair cut, and I've always been somebody that's kind of kind of keeps it pretty tight. Um, and I was the first couple of couple of uh, I guess six eight weeks, I was like, man, am I gonna let this thing grow out? How, how long am I let my hair gonna go uh, on our journey? And then I decided that. Uh, it made sense to start getting haircuts. So the first yeah, stop I went to, to, even though we're traveling, we want to stay, we want to stay fly and sharp. Some days you want to look rustic, right? But other days you still want to keep it together. Oh, ab absolutely, absolutely. So I, when I was in, um, in Chile, I went to this barber shop that they had uh, actually had Colombian barbers, and they they edged me up real tight, and they actually used um, the razor right out of the box. Um, heated it up a little bit and then he just put it on my skin jailhouse style and then so from there so from there I was like okay I'm gonna keep doing this so um and, and they just kept building up but it wasn't until about um probably about 14 months in I was in Buc Bucharest Romania getting a haircut and the the guy started asking me a lot of questions not only about my travel but also the, all the barber shops I've been to and I'm talking to him about these uh, 70 year old barbers in Hong Kong and these young hip hop kids in Vietnam and all the different haircuts I had gotten up to that point. And um, he just kept, he was kept asking more and more questions. So I went, I went back to the apartment we were staying at in B Bucharest and I told Nikki, I said, we might want to start documenting this and start sharing this with my friends back home uh, and other people that might not understand what it's like to go to barbershops and other places. So that's where the series started. I kind of regret not getting those first 14 months because I went to some awesome places but um, but from there we just started building up and we started putting those things down and uh, it's, it's as you said uh, you step into a barber shop there's there's a bit of no matter where you are there's a bit of um, um, machismo and uh, just that that, that kind of that feel that you get in a barber shop no matter where you are in the world uh, that feels right and even if you don't speak the language because when I was like in Japan uh, they didn't speak English so. But it's just that that body language, uh, this the smile, it's how you enter the room, all those things that make sense uh, that they can vibe off of. And then as you just describe what you're trying to get on your hair and maybe even use your phone to, to show them like what it used to look like, um, then they understand what to do. And, and it's kind of it's, it's just nice and comforting 
to, to go through that process. And uh, there's a ton of different styles, a ton of different ways to do it. Uh, I was in Doha, Qatar in the Middle East. The gentleman used a, a flame, a fire to get the tiny, tiny hairs off my ears. Um, there's all kinds of different ways to get hair. Let's back up. When, when you saw him light that flame, brother, what, what uh, were your thoughts? <laughs> well, luckily, luckily, I got there a little early, so I saw him do it on somebody else before me. So at that point, I knew, uh, I was like, whoa, what is going on here? And then, uh, so when I was in the chair, I wasn't, I wasn't too shocked. But uh, but it was still uh, a shocking experience to Man, feel that I love flame that. on your ear. Like you, I didn't. I wish that I would have recorded more. I did a lot of. I took a lot of photos of the barbers that I sat down with. I was enamored with chairs. I was enamored with their process. I was in, enamored in awe with the space and how it looked because at the time I was building a set and I wanted to build this set that when people came to the show, Matt, that they felt like that they were in a barbershop. And when I met Mr. Malden, I mean, you can you can only imagine the conversations that I had with him about Dr. King. And, and of course, I didn't even get a haircut. He says, most people come here and they don't get a haircut. They just want to talk to me about the people. And not only did he cut Dr. King's hair, because you know, at the time, remember, uh, African-Americans can only cut African-Americans hair. And he, yeah. Dr. King and all these other celebrities, they couldn't go to some of the white barbershops. So when they were in Alabama at that time, they would stop there. But I would look at some of the processes. I remember being in Africa, like what you just said, where the guy took the razor and I'm looking at this dude, cleaned it off, it was very, very clean. And he just did his thing. And I'm sitting here like, man, this is, this is amazing. But yeah. the stories, so any similar stories that you discover, you, you talk about the processes. What are some of the things that you were hearing uh, as you were traveling in the barbershops from not only just the people in the chairs, but maybe the people that were just in the space, because it is a culture when you yeah, walk yeah. into those spaces. Yeah, it's the best. I, the, the interaction between barbers is fantastic. Um, I, the, some of the highlights of those interactions in Vietnam, Da Nang, Vietnam, um, there's like these, uh, they're all like 18 to 22 year olds. And they're super talented barbers, but their interaction between each other, the music is just blaring. It's like a, it's like a, uh, 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 like a hip hop um, nightclub in the bar, in the barber shop as you're getting a haircut. So it's just, it's amazing to to uh, to, to experience that in in that camaraderie. And then as you see um, some of the um, kind of the locals and the the regulars come in there and their interactions with them, even though it's in a foreign language, you understand that uh, these, these guys are close and they've had those friendships and those bondings. And so you, you would see that in different places around the world, even like in Hong Kong, these, uh, these 70 year old men, there were probably five different 70 year old men in that, in that barbershop. And they didn't use the, uh, the clippers. The zzz, they didn't use that. They only use scissors, scissors to cut your hair. And it's, it's so things like that. You're like, When's this guy gonna bust out the? When's he gonna bust out the clippers? No, they're cutting the whole thing by scissors, and they, he does a great job. So things like that, uh, even though there's differences, it's that those little friendships and bonding that you can that you can feel um, in the barber shop. That it's really awesome. So you talked about friendship. You talked about bonding. Um, I want to park right there and, and 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 unpack a little bit about friendships. You talk to me about the process of making friends while you're overseas and while you're traveling. How do you make those connections? How do you engage someone who speaks a different language, who comes from a different culture? How do you how do you even approach them? For me, for me, it was really important because we were going to some some unique places around the world where there wasn't a ton of tourism. Um, when we could, we would go to smaller towns and villages. So for me, it was always really important to represent America the best that I could because you never knew if that, that if I was the only American they were ever going to meet. And if I was, I wanted them, them to say, man, Americans are super nice. This guy was awesome. And, be, and because I'm six foot six, I rock the beard. I'm, I'm a big guy. Whenever I walk, whenever I walk in, I, I don't know if they're going to be intimidated. And, and certain, in certain places around the world, I look like a giant to these people. So I, I would always, athlete. yeah. And I look like an athlete. So uh, I always try to approach with a, a smile first make a lot of eye contact, make sure that they know that I'm, I'm there for all the right reasons and um, try to establish that right away and maybe even do some kind of like a bodily like jabbing or whatever to, to get people to, to say like, oh, this guy's a nice guy. Because it's someplace around like India, I would have people come up and just start grabbing me. They, they just want to, they just want to like kind of see, is this dude real or not? It's, it's really, really wild. But you just, you get, you get that and you can't be intimidated 
and you just show them that you're trying to do the right thing and, and you're trying to be positive. So that was the first string. That's definitely a level of maturity. I remember being in high school, I started traveling to Latin America, in particular Mexico. I went to a historically black college in Louisiana and my Spanish teacher would take us to Mexico every year. And he, we would go to Northern Mexico where folks look more European. And so you would see these African-Americans in these, uh, in these shops, these bodegas. And I remember the girls having the braids and things like that. And the women wanted to come up and, and you know, one we always say in the black community, never touch a black woman's hair. I don't care what where you are. But they were really enamored and, and looking at it. And I had to tell the young ladies, they haven't seen this before. It's not like we're an alien, but to hear you as a let's say as a white male who yeah. is definitely a minority in that environment, it's really the same thing. And I think quite often we think in other cultures, you're the only one to stand out. You walk in, you six foot tall, especially in Asian countries where people are typically shorter. There is this level of of intimidation where is he from i want to touch him but you have to be in a matt you got to be in the right mind for that right because again yeah, yeah. the wrong person if you come up and touch them and, and you're looking at them like they're strange um it can go in a, it can go in a different direction i remember being in dc it's gonna be funny so i was in dc went for a run around the jefferson monument took a break just to sit down I see a whole bunch of Asians get off the bus. So I'm watching this because, you know, typically I'm looking at Asian, my Asian friends I know, they love the camera. They love taking these photos. So this, this guy comes up to me. I'm just chilling on the steps, man, minding my own business. He comes up like, oh, so you want me? And I love, languages are so universal without even talking. Just the language of looking and engaging and the hand movement. So he gives me the camera. So I'm thinking he wants to take a picture. He wants me to take a picture of the people that were on the bus with him. And he was like, he was like, no. So he gave his friend the camera and he took a picture with me. And I was like, this dude is about to go back and like, man, I met black people. I met black people. I yeah. Now I could have been a jerk about it. I could have been, but, but, but that was an experience that we both really exchanged. No, I don't know where that photo might've gone, but the experience yeah. and exchange, I think is really, really important and and, and and talk to me about experience and, and preparation. So you leave this job, I want to go back. And how do you yeah. then prepare to then travel across the country? Because somebody's listening like, I wish I can do this, but I have kids. I wish I can do this. I don't have money. Talk to me about the, the preparation to do that. You talk, we talked about soul craving and going deep, but what's the prep to do that? But then also share with my listeners, what are you and your wife doing when you're going to these countries? You know, what do you do when you get there and what are your plans? Yeah, that's awesome. Can I, can I talk about the, the photo thing first real quick? Yeah. I, I, I used to, so when I, when that would happen to me, I would, and they would want to take a picture with me with, with their camera. I would always flip the script and say, now can I take a picture of you with my camera? Mm -hmm. So, so because it, it showed them that they thought I was, um, like valuable yes. or uh, celebrity-ish in their own way because they never see me. And I wanted to show them at the same level, you're important to me as well. And I would like to take a photo with you. So that was always a good way. And then from there, then you can start to talk to people as well. And that made it awesome. I, I did a lot of group selfies. If I saw if I saw 30 people staring at me, I would just say, hey, let's all take a selfie together. And at first it's, a, it's an amazing photo, but then it, it kind of, it makes it real easy to take that next step. But um, so preparation, uh, it was, it was, a, it was a process. So it, obviously it took years for us to get to the situation where we, we felt financially comfortable enough to take off two years and, um, and then take that leap before that, you got to understand if, if you have, if you have faith in your skills, you feel you have faith in this, you've built a skill set that is valuable and you feel like you can re-enter the market. That's the most important thing. And that's where my wife and I were at. She's, she's an amazing pharmacist. She's a clinical pharmacist working in a hospital. She was very nervous about leaving because she's like, Matt, I'm in the medical field. It's not like you as a sales professional, you can't just leave and come back and get a job. And it, but for me, it was, it was the, the reiteration of, but you're, you're very good at what you do. You're very professional. There's a need for you. Um, somewhere in this ecosystem, the, the same place she left, hired her back. I knew that that's was going to happen. That she would think that she wouldn't be hired back because when you talk about the medical field, that's something is in all the countries that you've gone to. She could have been like, "Well, the hell with this country. Let me go back to Nicaragua, Honduras. Let me go back to yeah. Asia to to do these things." That's interesting that she would think that she didn't wouldn't be able to come back into her profession. I think it might be the competitive the competitiveness of the of the medical doctorate and, and the things that they go through through that process that they're always like trying to fight with their peers to be the best. I, I don't know what it is, the psychology behind it, but it, you see that often in, in that profession of people thinking, well, I can't do certain things because uh, it's either gonna be frowned upon or it's uh, it's harder to reenter. But I just kept instilling in her like, you're gonna be fine, you're gonna be fine. And me as a sales professional, I knew I'd be fine. 
um, because everybody needs a sales guy at some point. And uh, whether I'm, I'm selling roofs on a house or selling what I was doing in technology, um, I'd find a job. And so for me, it was more about the, it was more about the experience um, than, than the, the income I was having. I just wanted to, I wanted to live my life. So, um, so yeah, so, so we, we, had to, we had to prepare our skills to have that confidence to leave it, to get the money financially to leave. But the thing that people don't understand is traveling is not expensive. The, the, the way you do certain travel, if you stay in a resort, you're, you're flying a certain way, you're, um, you're, you're trying to do it, uh, the, uh, staying at five-star hotels, that stuff can be expensive. But if you're doing travel in an authentic way where you're staying at Airbnbs and, and you might have a host there with you, I um, mean, so you're kind of sharing, a, you're in a bedroom in somebody's house uh, in a foreign land, that stuff could be really cheap. And then when you're thinking about what we did, where we would stay in a, geographic, uh, a geographical area for a long period of time. Like we were in South America on the West coast of South America for three and a half months. So the, the getting to other places was not expensive. So once we were there getting from Santiago, Chile and, and Valparaiso up to the Northern parts of Chile, San Pedro de Atacama, which is gorgeous. And then going to Machu Picchu and then going out to the Galapagos Islands. Um, police, usually Galapagos Islands would be expensive, but we were already in Peru and then we got to Ecuador, so so we and we could be flexible with our time. So then it became cheap. So it, because we we carved out um, long periods of time in an area, we really drove our costs down. And then we did some creative things around volunteering, where uh, there's websites out there, Workaway, where we volunteered our services for a place to stay. We did a bed and breakfast, and and uh, we for a month in, on a Greek island, we we helped a lady out with her bed and breakfast, so she gave us a place to stay and some food. Um, we did the same thing in South Africa at a surf lodge for a month where we, we helped them at their, um, at their resort and they gave us a place to stay, met some other awesome travelers and really got embedded in that, in that area in South Africa. So there's different ways. We, here's, there's a, here's a crazy one people don't understand. There's a, there's a website called Trusted House Sitters where you can watch people's pets and they'll give you their house. So Zurich, Switzerland, extremely expensive, probably somewhere we couldn't have gone based on our budget. But we watched these two cats for three weeks and had a two bedroom, uh, two, two bath, awesome house on, uh, right near Lake Zurich. And it was an amazing trip, all that for free because we watched two cats that were basically doing their own thing the whole time. So there's ways to keep your costs down. Uh, when you I got, this. I have some people that got two pit bulls in the projects in New York. If you and your wife <laughs> babysit two pit bulls in the project uh, and your wife got Chicago roots, I'm sure she could, she could handle it. <laughs> How do you how do you all go about choosing where you're going where you're going to travel? Well, this well well now it's a little different. Now we're kind of trying to see like okay, uh, what are those kind of those those locations we get a chance to travel to on the big trip that uh, that really are deep in, inside our heart that we want to put at the top of our list to make that happen. Um, so so that's that's now. So we got we got that list is always growing, but we've got some t places at the top of that list. When we were traveling with the big trip, it was really about um, staying in the sun. We, we love the sun. We love, we love warm climates and we only had one backpack of peace. So we had to have warm weather ish. So we followed the sun for those two years. Um, and then once we're in a, in an area, it would be like, okay, where, where, what are the, is there an event going on? Are there th certain things going on as, as an event that really brings the culture together? So like, um, big festivals are amazing ways to understand the cultures. So we had a chance to go to a lot of festivals in, in Europe and get to see that sporting events are huge. So I got to see sumo wrestling in Japan, um, rugby in Australia, um, uh, cricket in India, or, um, and cricket on the streets of India with the kids, but also cricket matches in South Africa. So sporting events really brings crowds together. You get to see how people love their sports and stuff like that. Music is huge, obviously, going to music festivals or just small concerts or even like bar settings where you get to hear people's music. But uh, so those 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 activities would drive us to certain locations and then we would just take it all in. So that's um, and then we were really um, just passionate about just trying to understand new cultures, too. And, and if there's some some place that we're like, what wonder what that's like or there's a bit of our heritage that aligns with that, then we'll go see that as well. So as we sit here and listen to, as we sit here and vicariously, you know, live through your life, you and your wife's life, what do you want my listeners to walk away from your experience as you share your experience with them? What do you want them to walk away to say, to feel, to do? And what's been your greatest lesson from this entire experience of traveling the world? My biggest thing is for people to understand that they can live out their dreams. I, I realize that, um, not everybody wants to travel. Not everybody wants to travel internationally. Some people only want to travel around the U.S. 
Um, so that was my dream. But you got to understand that if you're always watching on social media, everybody living out their dreams and you don't think it's, it's possible for you to live out your dreams, it is possible. So that's the biggest thing that, that I always try to share with people of uh, this was my goal and I put it on paper. I'm really big on writing things down on paper. There's something about if, you, if you're telling the universe on pen and paper and the universe can see your list, uh, the, the, the world's going to work hard to make that stuff happen to you. And then you put the action behind it to bring those things to life. Um, it can happen. So um, those, those are the kind of the basic uh, things that I, I try to tell people is you got to understand where you're trying to go. It's just like when we were traveling the world, we knew we were trying to, we, we knew where we were going, trying to get to, but we had to create a way to get there. And it's the same thing with your life. If you don't know where you're trying to go and you're just living life, just la di da, you're going to look back in three years and be like, what, where'd that go? What happened there? But if you know the direction you're trying to get to, you put it on paper, you have goals and ideas on how to get there. Then it's, it's, you understand every day why you're doing this with a purpose to achieve these things. Favorite place you, you and your wife travel to and place that you like, uh, I'll never go need to go back there again. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst. Um, uh, favorite place is so hard. We, we, uh, the common answer is Vietnam. We, we just loved our time in Vietnam. It was amazing. Um, J Japan was also a stunner. Um, but I love, I love India, something about India just, it really speaks to me. And I just, I just love India. Uh, the place that uh, we've actually talked about it openly before, but Ushaiwa, Argentina, it's the end of the world down there. It's, it's like the last stop to Antarctica, but it was just a miserable stop for us. It rained the whole time. It was super cold. We stayed in an Airbnb where uh, it was a family of four with a barking dog and we were up top and we could hear everything they were doing. <laughs> so it was, and they had a baby, like a newborn baby crying. They never even like put it on the listing. We have a baby, it might cry, <laughs> it cried the whole time. So that was a brutal stay, but, well, um, think but yeah. That's important to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All night long. Yeah. Well, Matt, it's been a it's been an honor hanging out with you, brother, learning about you, learning about your travel, stepping out on faith, following your mission and your vision uh, with your partner from award winning sales executive to a world traveler. Any final thoughts for our listeners? And what's the best way for my listeners to get in contact with you? The best way to follow me is we, we have the website passportjoy.com. Everything's there. Uh, my YouTube channel is, is where I'm trying to get people to feed to now. So I'm, I'm trying to do more videos, obviously sharing all the barber experiences there. And uh, so if you just look up Matt Javit, J-A-V-I-T, um, you'll find my, my YouTube page. And uh, that's, that's a great way to connect. What impact do you want to leave on the world, Matt? Uh, openness to cultures. Uh, the, the, the idea that uh, putting having another man put a blade on your neck is about as intimate as you can get and uh, putting yourself out there. And, and when it, you don't owe him any money or drugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, you're, you're just meeting him and you're saying, it's okay for you to do this to my face. It's, it's a, I just, by, by doing that and exposing myself, my hope is that people will just take that first trip out of their comfort zone to experience new cultures around the world because it's going to change your life forever. Well, I love it, man. I love everything that you've done, but you cannot leave right now because the second part of the show is called the Super Bomb Questions and it's brought to you by Mountain Maid. I'm going to ask you some questions and I need you to respond as quickly as possible. So you ready, Matt? Let's do it. Here we go. What's your favorite word? Passport. <laughs> What's your favorite quote, Bible, scripture verse, or a song or a lyric? Uh, the, the saddest thing in life is wasted talent. It's from the movie of Bronx Tale. Yes, love that movie. What's your superpower? Um, the ability to know that I can live out my dreams. What's your spirit animal? Uh, sea lion. What brings you to tears of joy? Seeing underdog hustlers make the unthinkable happen. What brings you to tears of sorrow? Uh, uh, meeting kids and uh, impoverished areas that have no shot. What do you wish you had more time to do? Read. What values do you live by every day? Gratitude and appreciation. Hmm. How do you express gratitude with those you love? Um, reaching out, telling them. If you were in the Mr. America talent competition or the Mr. International talent competition, Matt Javid, what would your talent be? Uh, probably shooting three pointers. I can still shoot a little bit. Still got it in you, Matt. I know you do. Let me, 
Let me see the form. Let me see the form real quick. There we go. Matt, mm -hmm. thanks for joining me. Welcome back. Welcome back from Honduras. Brother, it's been an honor hanging out with you, man. Thank you for hanging out with me today. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And I also want to thank my engineer, Alexander Blanc, my super duper producer, Nicole Klimpaka. Please get well. We need you. We need you. We need you. I also want to thank Supremacy for our theme music and all of you for listening. Make sure you subscribe. Leave a comment. If you want to know more about me, if you want to pick up some of our merchandise, you can go to drdrlds.com. And as always, believe that something wonderful is about to happen. But some people miss the message because they're too busy looking for the mess. Not you because you're listening to Sound Bombing. Peace. Mountain Maid is changing the CBD game by offering a line of high-dose CBD tablets at an affordable price. Their products are THC-free and third-party tested for accuracy, cleanliness, and potency. Their products, which ship nationwide, include Build for CBD saturation, Boost for precision titration, and Recover for rest and rehab. With nine years experience in hemp and fitness, Mountain Maid's founders are focused on creating a quality product to help those who live an activated lifestyle. Check out mountainmade.life. Again, that's mountainmade.life to find out more about how their products can help you crush life. Remember, their products ship nationwide. Go check out their website today and follow them on social media. At Mountain Made, that's the at symbol M N T M A D E. Our staff at Sound Balming uses Build before our morning workout, which helps to push our bodies to a whole new level on a daily basis. Try Build, try Boost, try Recover. Our staff is using these products to enhance our active lifestyle naturally, and we are crushing life with Mountain Made CBD, and you can too. Start today by going to mountainmade.life and ordering Build, Boost, Recover, or the multitude of other products that they have which will enhance your lifestyle. I promise you, you won't regret it.